Cuckoo's Nest. I think this might be the very first fiddle tune that I ever heard. I remember my dad, when I was about 10 years old, went to the local record store and brought back the self-titled Nickel Creek record. We popped it into our CD player, listened to the whole thing, and I remember this tune really stuck out. It's one of the first times I'd heard a mandolin and first time I'd really heard a bluegrass fiddle tune like this. Turns out that this is not a modern tune. This one dates all the way back to the 1700s from the United Kingdom. And there's been so many different strands of this one from what I can tell, eventually coming to the bluegrass circle and whether you've heard it from Nickel Creek or from Mark Howard or from John Hartford or Norman Blake, this is a really fun tune to have in your repertoire. And part of the reason why I like this tune so much is that it's very modal sounding, right? We start out in the regular old key of D major, but we quickly transition to the D mixolydian mode and back and forth between the two throughout the duration of the tune, which can mean that it's a little bit harder to improvise over the chord changes in this one because of those shifting key centers. But what I wanna do here is not only show you the chords and the melodies of this tune, but I also wanna show you this worked out solo that I came up with for the chord changes, just to give you an idea on how you can vary the melody, get some ideas up and down the neck in these key centers centers and uh, it sounds something like this. So if you're up for this journey, let's uh, grab your mandolin and start off by learning the chords to this one. We've got four chords in this tune, starting with your root chord, D major. Next up is A, C major, and G. If you're not familiar with those same chords in the chop shapes, here are those shapes as well. Starting off with your D chop, A, C, and G. So next, let's come over to the transcription and check out the chord progression here. We have a simple two-part structure like we usually do in fiddle tunes, A section, B section, both eight measures long with repeats. I'll walk you through the A section first here. We've got one measure of D, then one measure of A, one measure of C, one measure of G. On the next line, we have two measures of D, quick G, quick D, quick A, back to D for a measure. Of course, we'd repeat the A section, then move on to the B here, which is a little bit easier than the A, right? We have two measures of D at the beginning, and then two measures of C. And then here we have two measures of D again, quick G, quick D, quick A, D for measure. That's actually the same as the last line on the A section, right? Then you'd repeat this B section, and that's the whole form. You can go back to the top and play it as many times as you want. So as we work our way to learning this melody now, let's come back to that idea of the major scale and the mixolydian mode, like I mentioned earlier. And I'm sure you probably already know your D major scale, but if you don't already, check out this other video that I made on major scales. Could be helpful in that area. But the main thing that you need to know between the D major scale and the D mixolydian mode, there's only one note that's different, right? In D major, you have the C sharp, and on D mixolydian, you have the C natural. This explains why we have the C major chord in our chord progression, because C major doesn't only fit within the key of D, because we have a C sharp note in our scale, right? If we build a triad on that note, we'd have a diminished chord, which would sound pretty weird here. But since in D mixolydian, we have the C natural, when we build a triad on this note, we have a C major chord. So suffice to say, you probably won't be playing a C sharp note while playing over the C major chord because that would sound pretty bad. <laughs> Another chord here is A major, which has a C sharp built into the triad, right? We have A, C sharp, E for your A major chord. And we probably won't be playing a, a C natural over that chord because that would make this a minor chord instead of a major chord. So these are the two red flag areas to watch out for as we learn the melody and later on as we learn this solo. And I'll walk you through my thought process on how to use these two notes kind of more tastefully, I think. <laughs> so coming over to learning this melody now, take a listen to me playing through this tune one more time and get this in your ears a bit more. See if you can know the differences between the C sharp and the C natural as I play through it here.
hey, if you've seen any of my videos before, you know the deal. You've got the transcription here on screen throughout the video. You have all the tools in front of you to learn this. But if you want the companion PDF and the MP3 backing tracks for this one, head over to my Patreon page at the link in the cards above. All right, bit by bit is our usual approach. We'll do two measure phrases at a time, and I'll walk you through all the details as we go through, starting with this first two measure phrase. And the two big challenges here are the two hammer-on triplets that we have, starting with the pickup measure, where we're hammering on from the open A string to the second fret on your index finger. We're grabbing the upstroke on the fourth fret before starting the downbeat of the next measure with this D note here. Similar idea on the next measure, we're just hammering on from the four to the five, then back down to the four. When you've got those, try this phrase together with me. Our first C natural comes up in this next phrase here. So starting out here over the C chord, we're kind of just playing a C major arpeggio. And then playing a pattern down to the low G before walking up for the next phrase. Here we go. And then lots more arpeggio action here for the third phrase. So we're pretty much working with a D major seven arpeggio here. We have A, F sharp, A, C sharp, and D. Then the open E is just leading up to the next F sharp and the second measure of this phrase. Another arpeggio here. And we're just kind of noodling around this G note while we're playing over the G chord. And then kind of a classic fiddle tune turnaround here. And the real feature here is on the last measure before the repeat, where we have this slide from the fourth fret on your G string with your middle finger up to the seventh fret, going pretty quick. And we're playing those open strings in this cross picking pattern to really flesh out the end before playing the hammer on triplet back to the top of the A section again. And of course you would normally play the A section again, but we'll stop there right before the hammer on triplet and see if we can just play through this A section once, stitch those four phrases together with the transcription and the backing track. Try it with me here. A one, two, three, four. For our next section here, you guessed that we got even more arpeggio action. And you might be seeing a recurring theme throughout this tune that we'll revisit later on. But for now, check out the first two measure phrase of our B. All right, so from the second ending of the A section, we have kind of these two notes that we're using for pickups. On the F sharp and G leading up to the open A on the downbeat of the B section. And then from there, we're just playing our D major arpeggio notes. They're out of order, right? We're starting with the A, the fifth of the chord, walking down to the root, doing that again, and then walking up to this high D on the fifth fret of the A. Even those last two notes at the end are D major arpeggio notes, right? So try this together with me. That pattern continues over our C major chord. All C major arpeggio notes, G, E, and C. Until the end here, we're walking up to the B, which isn't really a chord tone, it's kind of the major seventh. It sounds pretty nice. Doing this hammer on triplet as well to accent the C and the B again before ending the phrase. Here's that together. And just like how we saw those chords on the last line of the B section are exactly the same as the chords on the last line of the A section, the melody on this line is also exactly the same as the last line on the A section. So you already know these four measures. So let's see if we can play them together again. It's nice having that internal repetition. It makes the B section not too bad, right? So let's give it a shot together with that transcription and backing track. 
get a feel for the whole form of the tune, seeing how those first and second endings of the repeats work. Let's see if we can play through the whole thing from start to finish. Both A's, both B's. You got this. A one, two, three, four. <laughs> has really begun as we tackle this solo together and it is a little bit challenging i was actually having some trouble playing through it earlier recording it so uh take your time as you're working through this we'll start out just by listening down as i play through it again and then we'll break it down So this is what you might call a through composed solo because there's no repetition throughout the entire thing. It's all new ideas, but it's all centered around the melody, which is kind of a hard thing to do off the cuff, especially for a tough tune like this that changes key centers like we mentioned. But I actually like sitting down and writing out solos like this because it helps me organize my ideas and see how you can build on a melody and develop certain themes throughout your whole solo. So it's a really great endeavor. If you haven't done this before, try writing your own solos as well. But Learning other people's solos like this is another great way to expand your vocabulary to hopefully build your skill set so that you can do more of this stuff off the cuff later on. So with all that said, let's dive in and tackle this first two measure phrase. And first thing to note here is this much longer pickup phrase, right? Now we have a full measure of pickup instead of just the one beat of the hammer on triplet like we had in the melody. And this is kind of a nice way to ramp up into the start of your break and to fill in any transition gap from one solo to the next at the jam. And then from there, we're playing up the neck on the A string while we play some adjacent open D strings as a drone to kind of fill out some longer melody notes. The hard part is that shift from your pinky from the seven to the nine. And then using the open A to get back down to the first position with your index on the second fret here. The next phrase, we're kind of carrying on that open drone string idea, but now we're playing a C natural at the beginning to accommodate for our C major chord, right? A couple more slides here as well. One with your ring finger from the five to the seven of the A, one with your index from the three to the two, and both those happen on upstrokes with your right hand. Here's something nice. The next phrase, I thought it'd be fun just to return to the regular old melody again. So you already know this. The only difference here is what we're playing over the G chord, which is kind of a scale pattern where we walk up three notes from the root, G, A, B, and back to the G here. And I thought that would be a fun scale pattern to carry on for the next phrase. Sounds like this. So now we're doing that same scale pattern starting on the A note, then on the B note, and we're kind of starting on the C sharp, but then we deviate, hopping up to that high A, then down to the C sharp before moving on to the next phrase. Well, that's a lot already and it's only the first A section, right? So let's see if we can put those four phrases together and see what happens.
All right, on to the next line, and we're kind of back to some more melody here. Playing some longer notes here at the beginning, and then we have another hammer-on triplet from the open E to the second fret, back to the open string. Another hammer-on triplet, same as it is in the melody, and then we have kind of this chromatic leading tune. We're playing a G sharp on the sixth fret of the D string, which doesn't fit in our scale, but kind of works as a chromatic leading tone. Here it is in context. Here's the next phrase. So over the C chord, we're just playing the melody, right? But when we get to the G chord, here we're adding in a couple extra hammer-on triplets, right? We have the first one from the two to the three on the A string. The next hammer-on triplet is from the open A to the second fret on the A. Back down to the A. Then we have five open on the D string. And then the real trick is the last triplet here. Or here, we're actually playing every single note with our right hand. We're playing four with a downstroke, five with an upstroke, six with your pinky on the D string, with another downstroke. And we'll have to do another downstroke at the beginning of the next phrase to reset our pick directions, but for now, let's see if we can play this phrase together. I know that's kind of a weird place to end a phrase there on the sixth fret of your D string, but it's another chromatic leading out, leading you to the open A here for the next phrase. And from here on, this is where things get a little bit tricky because we're making our way up the neck from where we will not come back down to the very end of the solo here. And what we're doing is kind of playing another arpeggio idea all the way up to the 10th fret on your E string, that high D. And we're playing an arpeggio back down to the low D here on the fifth fret of your A. Then we're playing around a G chord using your pinky on the 10th fret of the A, walking up to the seven and then back down to the pinky on the A. Hopefully this went a little bit slower. Let's try this out. And here's the last phrase of that A section. We're kind of playing the melody an octave higher here. We have the hammer-on triplet from the seven to the nine. And here, the end is a little bit trickier. We have your first finger on the D on the fifth fret of the A. We're doing that open drone string again. And uh, we're kind of using some slides to shift further up the neck with an upstroke from the seven to the nine with your middle finger, another open D. And then we're sliding with your ring finger from the 10 to the 12 at the end. Kind of hard to see what this is like that slow, so here it is in context. Those shifts are kind of setting us up for the B section coming up next, but let's back up and see if we can play through this second A section of the solo all the way through. Nice, and to drill this home even more, let's come back to the start of the A section here on the solo and play through both A's with the backing track and transcription just to hear it all together. One, two, a one, two, three, four. So picking up where we left off, we just slid up with our ring finger to the 12th fret on the A string. And now we're gonna start this next phrase on your open D string and play some kind of harp arpeggio ideas. Check this out. That's kind of challenging, right? And it kind of takes a while to figure out where those open D and A strings fit within the mix as we play notes way up the neck here. So take your time as you're reading through this and see how it goes. For this next phrase, we're going to take that same idea that we just played and then move it down two frets to fit over the C chord. It sounds like this. And 
another weird place to end, but we're walking up chromatically to get to the next phrase. So try this out with me when you're ready. And then finally ending up with our index finger on the ninth fret here on the A string, the next phrase goes like this. Pretty much playing the melody here, but there's a lot more pinky action way up here on the high end of the neck, so take your time here. Then we're taking that arpeggio idea that we just ended the previous phrase with and we're moving it down a note on the scale, right? We're adding in some extra notes. And finally sliding down to the fifth fret for the next phrase. Well, that's the first B section. You got this. Let's see if we can play through what we've got so far for the B section together. Home stretch your last B, and we'll just slid down to the fifth fret of the E string. From here, we're kind of playing the melody up the octave. Watch out for that hammer on triplet all the way up to the 10th fret on your E string. And the next phrase kind of starts off with some more melody but gets a little wacky towards the end. <laughs> so we're starting off with our pinky on the 10th fret of the A string here playing the melody over the C chord. Kind of just placing some notes from the melody on this arpeggio playing that C note at the beginning of the next measure. And then from here, we're playing some chromatic nonsense. Ending up on the B flat here on the sixth fret of the E string. I promise it will make sense in a second. <laughs> For now, let's just give this a shot. Finally resolving that tense B flat down to the A here on our fifth fret of the E string for the next phrase. More arpeggios here, using that open A string as a way to shift back down to the first position. And playing a little pattern over this G chord here. Let's give this a shot. And then our last phrase goes something like this. So in the second measure of this phrase, we're doing another one of those articulated triplets where we're playing every single note with our right hand. So we're gonna have to play two down strokes in a row to reset our pick stroke again, a down on the second fret, followed by a quick down on the open A after that. Just watch out for this. Otherwise, you got this, so let's finish strong. All right, let's back up a little bit, play that last B section all together. We're gonna back up even further now, come to the beginning of the B section, see if we can even remember that now, and play through both Bs of this solo with that backing track and transcription. any determined souls who have made it this far in this video, you get the reward of getting to play through the entire solo from start to finish, all the A sections, all the B sections. That's a lot of material, but I've got faith in you. Let's try this together. One, two, a one, two, three, four.
folks. I hope you'll take all this content and kind of refashion it into some of your own ideas for this tune. And I'm of the persuasion that the more content that you consume for a tune like this, the better, because it just gives you a wealth of ideas. So write your own solo for this tune if you want to, or go transcribe Chris Thiele's solo, or uh, you know, try to improvise off the cuff on this one, or see if you can learn the melody up an octave, or do anything that comes to mind just to push yourself on a great tune like this. And in the meantime, be sure to subscribe for more videos like this. Check out some of the videos that you see here on screen. Join over on Patreon for all those extra learning resources. And thanks for watching. I'll look forward to seeing you in the next one.